Okay, we're ready to move on then to interpreting prophecy. Now, in the first part of this lesson, you should have a handout to assist you, which was not part of basic Bible interpretation, the textbook. But there are some things I want you to know, and I'd like you to go at this point to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Now, I have enjoyed studying and teaching prophecy over the years. I think there's great value in doing it. I believe that people find it interesting. I just think that they need to keep it in balance. You know, sometimes new believers want to know everything about what's going to happen prophetically. And I have sometimes said to them, there's a reason the book of Revelation is the last book in the Bible. Now, it's also true, though. We know from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and when Paul explains about how the restrainer will continue to restrain until he's taken out of the way, and how the man of sin will be revealed, and then he says, when I was with you, I taught you these things. Question, how long was he with him for? Three weeks to three months. And he was teaching them prophetic things. So it's not that there isn't a place for even newer believers to understand some prophetic things. And most likely, Paul probably met with them every day or night during those three weeks. He met with them often, explaining them. And he actually expected them to remember what he taught. What a novel idea. Now, when it comes to interpreting prophecy, again, the Bible has a lot of prophecy. Prophecy that's laid out like the image in Daniel chapter 2 and what it's connected with, or, or even the prophecy in Daniel 9 about the coming prince and how he's going to be cut off and so forth and so forth. Had they followed carefully Daniel 9, they should have known the very day Jesus Christ rode in on the full of an ass that he was the rightful Messiah. Unquote Palm Sunday. But they did not do their prophetic homework. And as a result, they missed it for the most part. But it was all there. In fact, the Bible, when it was originally written, at least a third of it was prophetic, which means prophecy it plays a major part in the Bible. Now, there's different reactions to studying prophecy. There's some normal reactions, like uh, the reaction of it's confusing. And some view prophecy as written in a secret code, which only Agent 99 can und undo. And this is due to the prophecies. Is this due to the prophecies or the neglect of teaching prophetic truth? My response when people say it's confusing is that the Bible is designed to be understood, including prophecy. Including prophecy. You see... Go to John chapter 16 for a moment. John chapter 16. In John 16, we read in verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. Now, by the way, I think in context, this is only in reference to the disciples. This is a pre-authentication of the New Testament. In fact, he says in chapter 14, if you go back there for a minute, John chapter 14... See if I can find it here. Verse 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance 
all things that I said to you. Who's you in the context? Those disciples, right? But notice, bring to remembrance. How can you explain the ability of the apostles slash disciples to write the New Testament, even things that Jesus said years, even decades after he said them? How do you do that? How do you explain that? The Holy Spirit and the promise of Jesus Christ and the ability for them to write the Word of God in a way in which it became infallible, without error. And this was promised by Jesus Christ. But go with me to Acts chapter 1 now. Yeah, we've been... Well, yeah, we've been beneficiaries of recall, but not that promise. <laughs> not that promise. Now, in Acts chapter 1, remember Jesus had taught kingdom, 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 kingdom. Then the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit comes. And then he says, I will build my church. But how many times did he say that? Just one time that's recorded. And then he begins to teach that he's going to suffer and die and be raised from the dead. And then he's still, it's still a lot of kingdom teaching, though not the gospel of the kingdom anymore. And he teaches the Olivet Discourse, and he says goodbye to Israel. He teaches the Upper Room Discourse. Hello, church, you're right around the corner. He suffers, dies, he's raised from the dead. And what do the disciples ask him in Acts 1? Verse 4, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, John 16, 14, 15, 16, which he said, You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, they knew there was going to be some delay. In fact, Matthew chapter 13 began to teach the parables of the kingdom of heaven is like, and now he begins to teach for the first time that there would be a delay in its being set up. But even then, they didn't think it would be a very long delay. Even after he suffered, was raised from the dead. They didn't think it would be very long. That's why he says, are you going to do it now? Yeah, we knew you said it would be a delay. They're thinking days, maybe weeks. How many of them thought 2,000 years? None of them, and neither would you, and neither would I have. But notice again, they want to understand this. And he says... In verse 7, and he said to them, It is not for you to know, now watch the phrase, times or seasons, which the Father has put in his own authority. But this is what you do need to know, that you shall receive power, and the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It's not for you to know times or seasons. But now go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now remember that phrase, times and seasons? Times and seasons? It's not for you to know times or seasons? Look at chapter 5, verse 1. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Why? For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. So we see that a lot of things have settled in their minds now. More revelation has been given. More understanding has occurred. And they have a much better understanding of the flow of eschatological truth in light of ongoing revelation. And so God does want us to understand the word of God. He doesn't say all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable except for the prophetic passages. Now, those are really not going to help you. They're so deep you'll never get it. No. Reaction. And so we do have a sense. Now it is true 
There are details that we do not know or maybe have a hard time understanding. I thought Rich McCarroll was very interesting when he made the comment about the fact that um, if you read old commentaries on, what was it, about the two witnesses, was it? And how every eye will see them? Or some of those kind of things? Listen to well, the old commentaries try to explain what that means. They had no idea. But we, 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 we don't think twice. We know how every eye could see it. But they couldn't understand that back then. Here's a second reaction to prophetic teaching. Well, it's impractical. How does it affect my life anyhow? Some will say, I'm not amillennial, I'm not premillennial, I'm not postmillennial, I'm panmillennial. It's all going to pan out in the end. So it doesn't really matter. That's not true. The response is the Bible correctly applied leads to practical, godly living. Leads to practical, godly living. In fact, I'm reminded again, 2 Timothy 3.15, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, fully equipped unto every good work. Thirdly, some will say, well, it's not important. It's irrelevant. It's non-essential. By the way, is any part of the Bible non-essential? Not essential? Response is, God says prophecy is important. In fact, in 2 Peter 1, he says that we have the more sure word of prophecy. We've got something more important and more sure and more certain, as it were, than Peter's eyewitness account on the Mount of Transfiguration. So God says prophecy is very, very important. 2 Thessalonians 2, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. Now, again, there's a textual variant here. This would be better understood the day of the Lord. Had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away, the departure comes first. And I am in agreement, Andy Woods and others, that I think that's referring to the rapture, not to the religious apostasy of the day. Because religious apostasy has been going on for a long time. So how would you know that came first? You'd never recognize it because it's been around all the time. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And again, that means it's important to know. Fourth reaction, it's going to happen anyhow. It's kind of the fatalistic, who cares, what does it matter? If we know about it, it's going to happen, whether we know about it or not. Is that how you view a news of an ongoing, coming tornado? It's going to happen either way. Does it really matter? Well, yeah, I think it does matter. I think you'd go to your basement. You know, well, there's, I know there's Hurricane Patricia coming, but who cares? Does it really matter? If it's going to hit, it's going to hit. Well, don't you want to be prepared? See, in fact, there is a special blessing attached to hearing and heeding prophetic truth. And in Revelation chapter 1 there, we see in verse 3 these words. Revelation 1 and verse 3. I found this really interesting when I finally began to grasp these things many years ago, when people say, oh, Revelation is so hard to understand, you're never going to understand it, it's so difficult, it's so strange, so symbolic. And then I read verse 3, blessed is he who reads, and those who hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. 
I'm thinking, there is a blessing attached to reading it, hearing it, and heeding it. Which means, I guess, it must be understood. Now, why does it say, blessed is he who reads? Why does it say that? Because remember, how would they have heard the book of Revelation? Did they all have their individual cop copies on their cell phones? No, it was publicly read. Publicly read. So blessed is he who reads it. Notice he, not they, who read. He. And the, those who hear. So you got one reader and you got a bunch listening. This is public assembly. No live webcasts. No, is it going to be archived? If you weren't there, you weren't going to hear it. And keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. So there's a blessing attached. Here's another one. People say, well, it's scary. It's scary. And I understand that. In fact, by the time the tribulation is over, you've got about three-fourths of the world dead. My response is, yes, prophecy can be frightening if you don't know the Savior. If I could quote Brett Nasworth, it'll scare the hell out of you. Pardon my Spanish. You know, when you, when you read in Revelation 6, verse 1, about the four horses of the apocalypse, when you read about the seal judgments, when you read about the trumpet judgments, when you read about the bowl judgments, when you read about Babylon and the beast and the blood of the mar martyrs, excuse me, and you read all of these things, yeah, you know what? It, it can be scary. When you read about Armageddon. And that's why, you know, the rapture is such a comforting hope. If you knew you were going to go through half the tribulation, I don't think you'd be real comforted. Or three quarters, or three quarters. Or, or all the way. No, we're comforted by knowing we're going to escape those days, though we certainly could experience some severe persecution prior to that. But again, when you know the book, you know, oh, Lord Jesus, come looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. By the way, you know, in Revelation chapter 10, do you remember what John was told to take the, the book you know, and eat it? Remember when I ate it, he says it was sweet. Got down to his stomach and it was bitter. And that's what prophecy is like. It's sweet for the believer, but it's bitter when you think about the unbeliever and what's all going to transpire as the wrath of God is poured out upon the planet. So as we think of some reactions to studying prophecy, we look at the normal reactions. Now, let's talk about the, oh, the normal reactions. It's confusing, it's impractical, it's again, it's not important, it's going to happen anyhow, it's scary, and yet we see there's a blessing associated with reading it, hearing it, and responding to it. Now, let's look at three dangerous reactions to prophecy. The number one is getting involved in date setting. Getting involved in date setting. It sounds sensational. Many people do this. And yet, how problematic in the face of what our Lord said in Matthew 24. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows. But even the angels of heaven, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. No one knows. And you know what, you know what people say today? Well, it's true, no one knows the day or the hour, but that doesn't mean you can't know the year or the month or the week. I'm dead serious. And if you ever listen closely, almost all of them think the Lord's going to come in the fall. Going to come in the fall. <laughs> now, why is that? They're almost always connected with Rosh Hashanah. Almost always. The Feast of Trumpets, and so forth. They're always connecting it with Old Testament feasts. You know, the problem with that immediately is that the church was a mystery. 
and no one knows the day or the hour. But according to Wikipedia, approximately 242 times a date has been predicted for Christ's return or the end of the world. Historically, 242 times. Most have been done in the past, but some are still yet future. For example, future predictions, Jeannie Dixon predicted, and it's going to happen in 2020. You know, fortunately, she's dead, so she won't know if it did or not, I guess. Huh? 2021, a man named Kenton Bishore, his prediction on the prior suggestion that Jesus would return in 1988 within one biblical generation or 40 years, the founding of Israel in 1948, Bishar argues that the prediction was correct, but that the definition of a biblical generation was incorrect and was actually 70 to 80 years. Placed in the second coming of Jesus between 2018 and 2028 and the rapture by 2021 at the latest. Why? Because he had to have seven years from the rapture too. Okay. The Messi Messiah Foundation International says it's going to happen in... 2026, members predict that the world is to end in 2026 when an asteroid would collide with Earth in accordance with Riaz, Ahmed, Gohar, Shahi's prediction in the religion of God. The chances are only one out of 300,000, supposedly. Sir Isaac Newton, ever hear his name? According to Sir Isaac Newton's research of the Bible, Jesus will rapture his church one jubilee from the time of Israel reacquiring Jerusalem. What's a jubilee? How that jubilee, I guess, is 70 years, huh? 70 years. And then there were many others that have predicted it as well. So now this guy is really, you know, a one, 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 twenty now. That's a ways off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But this is not new. 1843, Baptist preacher by the name of William Miller predicted Christ would return. And a lot of people actually sat on their houses and their, and their housetops, robed, waiting for him to come. Now they had faith. When people say they don't have enough faith, I mean, they had faith. They were sitting on the rooftops. But they had faith in the wrong object. So he recalculated, said, you know, I must have screwed it up. So he predicted it would be 1844 instead. And that's really sensational until that date passes, right? So who carries on the torch from William Miller, who was a Baptist, is a woman by the name of Ellen G. White. Ever hear of her name? Founder of the Seventh-day Adventists. And she made many predictions. She quit. She decided to quit about 1856, if I remember right. Because how many times are you going to be wrong before finally people catch on, right? She made many predictions, and yet others picked up the mantle from her, like, like Charles Taze Russell, who was the founder of the Jehovah Witnesses. And he predicted 1914 would be the end of the world. It wasn't the end of the world, it was the beginning of World War I. So he went by the wayside. In fact, you know, in 1914, they actually had a beautiful palace, or a beautiful house that he had built for Jesus to live in, in San Diego. And since Jesus didn't come, he lived in it instead. <laughs> then Judge Rutherford, which was a student of Charles T. Russell, he said, well, in 1914, the last days began. It was the start of Jesus' invisible presence. That's always great. That's our, and he became the king in heaven. But in 1925, the world would end. Only to see that come and go. In fact, you know, when you think of the prophecies made by the Jehovah Witnesses over the years, many false prophecies. And according to the Bible, it's not three strikes you're out as a prophet. It's one strike, you're up. You're a false prophet. In fact, in 1975, they lost a lot of members because they were tired of wrong prophecies. Now, in 1988, there was a book that came out, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988. And that went really good until 1989. 
in which the guy then revised his book and gave 92 reasons why Christ will come in 1992. Until that came and went. And then here's one, get ready, he's coming 2007. And that went by the wayside. And then you know, again, with, uh, what's his name, Harold Campy. May 21st was going to be Judgment Day here. Right? Well, May 21st came and went, and he recalculated again. It's amazing how they get this thing wrong. And even went around. In fact, you know, there are people in the, that believe that, that maxed out their credit cards. Because they didn't think they were going to have to pay for it anyhow. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Gomer piles that. So then they recalculated, right? October 21st, 2011. Came and went. And you know what Satan does with all this? He uses it two ways. On the one hand, he uses to deceive people and to believe in this stuff. And then when it doesn't come to pass, he uses it to disprove what people think the Bible said. And that you can't trust the Bible. So he uses it both ways. And not long ago, John Hagee, down in San Antonio, had his book, Four Blood Moons, Something's About to Change. And the Four Blood Moons was based again on the sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And guess what? The blood moon came and it went. You're not long ago. How many of you saw the blood moon? I didn't, but I wasn't surprised I was here yet the next day. Not long ago, Chris McCann of E-Bible Fellowship predicted October 7th. Came and it went. <laughs> this is what I found here. <laughs> Not. <laughs> Not. And so, a dangerous reaction is getting involved in date setting. Another dangerous reaction is making the study of prophecy an end in itself. And this is when it can turn into a spiritual novelty, like a new toy, spiritual pride and criticalness. As learning doctrine is never designed to be an end in itself. In fact, you know, as I think of that, I think of 2 Peter 3. Familiar with this passage? The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, get in white robes and sit on your housetops and wait for it to happen. No. True bird seed, contemplate infinity, sell all your stuff. No. Max out your credit cards. No. What manner of persons you ought to be in holy conduct in God. Notice, it's supposed to affect how we live from day to day. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless, and consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. As also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. So notice it's to affect how we live. And I say that because, you know, there's some people, they are so keen on prophecy, and they're always reading the newspapers to see what they think is prophetically happening, when in reality, but does it affect how they live? No. In fact, I'm always amazed at both people into prophecy and creation. And I'm a creationist, as you know. I am a six-day creationist, without apology. But I'm always amazed how Christian creationists are so precise on all this scientific stuff, and they screw up the gospel almost always. This blows me away. And how these people into prophecy, again, have all these things, and they're this. when it comes to just getting the gospel right, they hardly ever get it right. They strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. They miss it. 
So don't make the study of prophecy an end in of itself. And also, don't get involved in irrational and unbiblical behavior. You know, again, selling property and going to the mountains to wait in a commune. That kind of stuff. You know, moving to California, growing a beer, calling yourself Moses, and having a following in half an hour. You don't need to do that. You know, years ago, I went to a Dodgers game. One time, I went out to California. And they were playing the Cubs. And it was a loaded Dodger stadium. And as we came out of it, there was a guy in a blowhorn, one of these megaphones. And he was saying, Los Angeles, Jesus is coming. You need to be ready. Well, it's true. He's coming. But then how is he explained how to be ready? He got it wrong once again. And we need to get it right. Notice again, instead of irrational and biblical behavior, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That should affect how we live from day to day. And so there's nothing wrong with prophecy. There's great reasons to study it. First of all, theologically, we should study prophecy because it is a repeated theme in Scripture. Prophecy occupies between a quarter and a third of the Scriptures Entire books are given over to it, like Zechariah, 1 Thessalonians, Revelations are given over to it. The second coming has been taught by Christ and others. In fact, it's been said one out of every 25 verses in the New Testament mentions something related to the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's amazing. Secondly, you need to study prophecy because it gives you concrete answers to the hard questions of the future. Where will people spend eternity? Where are the dead? Who will share in the resurrection? What will heaven be like? How many judgments are there? Will believers be judged? Will the nations be judged? Will the church go through the tribulation? And on and on we go. And as you study the Bible, Prophetically, it gives you concrete answers to those questions that we want to know about. Thirdly, we need to study prophecy because it affirms the divine inspiration of the scriptures. One of the great evidences for the inspiration of the scripture is fulfilled prophecy. Of the 333 or so prophecies given about Christ's coming, we know that 224 of them or so were not fulfilled in his first coming. They're yet to be fulfilled. Over a hundred were fulfilled in his first coming. Which tells us we've got a unique book here in the Bible. And it affirms it's inspired by God because no other book could ever predict like this. Fourthly, we should study prophecy because it impresses us with Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and King. In fact, remember again, what did Jesus say to the disciples on the road to Emmaus? These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the Law of Moses and the Prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Or Revelation 1.1, the revelation of who? Of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel, to his servant John. In fact, regarding the revelation of Jesus Christ, we read in Revelation 19.10, And I fell at his feet to worship him, namely an angel. John fell at the angel's feet, and he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren, who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And if we walk away from studying prophecy and we somehow disconnect it with Jesus Christ, we have missed the mark. So we should study the Bible 
as it relates to prophecy, not only because of theological reasons, but secondly, because of practical reasons. Because it can produce confidence in times of uncertainty. Confidence in times of uncertainty. Remember when Jesus predicted in the Upper Room Discourse that he was going to depart. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there, you may be also. Notice, this was designed to comfort their troubled heart. See, a prophetic promise gave them hope that God was still in control, he was still on the throne, he is going for a purpose, he's coming again, he's preparing a place, and he's going to receive us to himself. Boy, that is important. Can you imagine if this life was all it was? In addition, it can produce conviction in the hearts of the lost. It is interesting to note that when Paul spoke on Mars Hill, he not only started at creation and walked his way through, but we read in Acts 17, 30 through 34, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in the future on which he will in the future judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance to this to all by raising him from the dead allows him to come again. Notice this is prophetic truth, that he's going to judge the world in righteousness by Jesus Christ, whom he raised from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, three responses, number one, some mocked. Number two, others said, we'll hear you again on this matter. It's not that important delay. So Paul departed from them, among them. However, some joined him and response number three, they believed. Among them Dionysus, the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. And so the Holy Spirit did use this teaching of Christ, and even the fact that he will come in judgment in the future to cause them to see a need and to eventually be saved. You know, evangelists in the past have said one of the greatest themes to be utilized in evangelism is prophetic truths. Practically, number three, because it can produce consistency in the midst of difficulty and disappointment. Consistency. What's the great uh, resurrection chapter in the Bible? 1 Corinthians 15, right? What is the practical application of it? One verse, the last. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That's the practical application. We should live expectant lives, but we should remain steadfast, because Jesus Christ is coming again. He truly was raised from the dead. And in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, we're going to be raised and or changed. Fourthly, from a practical standpoint, again, it can produce comfort in the face of sorrow. By the way, you know in that great rapture passage, again, how does it end? Therefore, comfort one another, how? With these words. Which means these words were designed to comfort. And prophetic truth comforts. Isn't it comforting, first of all, when someone dies that you know where they went? If they're saved? You know they're with the Lord. You know they're much better they're, than they, they've been. You know they're enjoying the presence of God. You know they're going to have a future resurrection of the body. You know many things that are going to happen. That is very comforting. Fifthly, it's because it can produce change in the lives of believers can produce change. And by the way, that was the point in 1 Thessalonians 5, and that was the point in 2 Peter 3. If we really know what's going to come, 
we should live in light of that and consistent with it. And notice again, the end of this passage, therefore comfort each other and edify one another just as you're doing. But earlier he says, but you brethren are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Lastly, it can produce cleansing. Cleansing in the light of Christ's return. Cleansing. In fact, I was hoping to get to this yesterday, but obviously I was far off. But Lord willing, I'll get to it Wednesday night. In 1 John 3, this is a great passage, students. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God and has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. In other words, it has a purifying effect on our life. A cleansing effect on our life when we are looking for the return of the Lord Jesus. And by the way, only imminency can do this. Imminency can do this. There's a difference between looking forward to something and looking for something. And I want to explain that difference. Today is October 26th. We think of the holidays. What are we looking for? Well, Halloween would be the next. Thanksgiving, we're looking forward to Thanksgiving, looking forward to Christmas, but we're looking for Halloween, if you want to even consider that. We're not heretic here, just make it official. There's a difference between looking for something and looking forward to something. Looking for something means you're looking for it to happen anytime. Looking forward to something means it may not happen anytime, but you really look forward to that day. By the way, I am looking forward like never before to the kingdom. That'll come one day. But I'm not looking for the kingdom. But I'm looking forward to the kingdom. I'm looking forward to when the wrongs are righted. I'm looking forward to when there's righteousness dwelling on the earth. I'm looking forward to that, but I'm looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, because that could happen at any time. And I say that because I, re I was sharing with someone once, and he was really bothered by this when he told me that it, he really bothered him when Tom Stiegel made the comment, and I've made this comment before, that if you don't believe the rapture is pre-tribulational, you're really looking for the Antichrist, not Jesus Christ. Because the Antichrist has to come before Jesus Christ does. Oh, he was bothered by that. And he said, I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. And I s said to him, again the illustration, if you know that Thanksgiving has to precede Christmas, you know that you may look for Thanksgiving and looking forward to Christmas. But what has to come first? And in the same way, if you don't believe the rapture is pre-tribulational, you have to look for the Antichrist and you may look forward to Jesus Christ. But there's a definite difference between the two. Personally, why study prophecy? Well, to the unbeliever, it should eliminate skepticism. It should eliminate skepticism. In fact, go to 2 Peter chapter 3 with me here. 2 Peter chapter 3. 
verse 3. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly forget. Isn't that interesting? They willingly forget this. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old. And the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. And when you see the word world, what do you think of? You think of earth? People on the earth? You think of a select group or not? No, you don't. Verse 7, but the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Notice, one of the reasons the Lord Jesus Christ has not returned is, is because he wants people to get saved. But even as you think of what God has done in the past, if you're really willing to think about it, which many are not, is it true that all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation? Is uniformitarianism really true? And the answer is no. We clearly see that God intervened in human history in the past by way of judgment and blessing, judgment on the earth and blessing to Noah and his family. And we know that he will do that again, but not by water, but the next time by fire. And so not only should it eliminate skepticism if you're willing to just consider the truth of human history, but it should encourage the receiving of salvation. Salvation. God is waiting. And by the way, remember there's always a time of grace before God drops the hammer. Remember, how long was the ark of building? How long did Noah preach? 120 years before the judgment came. And God for 2,000 years since the cross has been appealing to people to come to the foot of the cross just as you are Believing Christ died for sinners and willing to justify the ungodly through simple faith in him. So it should encourage the receiving of salvation. But for the believer, again, it should encourage a godly life. A godly life. A, should discourage a materialistic life as we work our way through the passage. Knowing all these things are going to burn, why would we live for things? And it should develop an expectant outlook. An expectant outlook in life. Something to look forward to. Jesus is coming again. Things are truly going to get better. The promise, the, the future is as bright as the promises of God. And we should live in light of that. And so, there's a lot of reasons to study prophecy. Theologically, practically, personally. And so don't ever downplay the importance of prophecy. There is a great importance. Let's not get imbalanced about it. Let's not that be the only thing we study. Let's not set dates. On the other hand, let's study the Word of God and let it impact us and affect how we live from day to day. But if, if it's going to do that, you're going to have to rightly divide the word of truth. You're going to need to study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So what, is, what are the differences between the millennial views? The millennial views. What is premillennialism? Well, again, let's define the word millennium. 
The word millennium comes from the Latin word milli, meaning thousand, and annus, meaning year. The prefix pre means before. So it literally means before a thousand years. Now, sometimes we say the millennial kingdom. Frankly, it's not a millennial kingdom. It's really an eternal kingdom that has the millennium. You know, just a little. J.B. Hickson helped me with this, which was very good. He says, you know, everywhere in Scripture, the kingdom is stated as eternal. We just know that the first phase of that kingdom is the millennium. But I understand if someone says millennial kingdom, I'm not trying to get bent out of shape about that. I'm just trying to be precise and not be misleading. Premillennium means that Christ's return will precede the thousand-year rule of Christ on earth. Premillennium. What's another term for this? It's called chiliasm or chilialist. And then this comes from the Greek word. And for a thousand. Now, what are the three basic tenets of premillennialism? First of all, Christ will return in the rapture at the end of this age and will reign with his saints on the earth for a thousand years as king. Okay? Now, that's true. Will reign at the end of this age and will reign with his saints on the earth for a thousand years as king. In other words, the, the return of Christ will be premillennial. Now, remember, you can go on to say, it will it be pre-tribulational? But we're just talking about premillennial at this point. Number two, in the millennium, the nation of Israel will experience the blessings of God promised to Abraham and David pertaining to Israel's land, nationality, and king. Again, there's a distinction between the church and Israel and that the promises made to Israel in the Old Testament have not been canceled merely postponed to be fulfilled in the future. Thirdly, therefore, the church today is not fulfilling the promises made to Israel as a nation. And in doing so, you have to again keep Israel and the church separate. Premillennialists do that. The second view is amillennialism. Amillennialism. And again, the prefix ah means no or none. So literally it means no millennium. In other words, ah millennium is a view that there will be no, this is what should be emphasized, literal reign of Christ on earth for 1,000 years. No millennial reign. In fact, they teach that the kingdom's going on right now. You know, it's kind of interesting because when you find a Jew, an Orthodox Jew who knows the Old Testament and therefore knows what the kingdom's going to be like, and they hear that the kingdom's going on right now and they're living in Brooklyn looking around saying, I don't see the lamb laying with the lamb and I don't see... I mean, none of them would come to that conclusion. You have to buy into that. Now, I think I shared this at the pastor's conference, but... You know, I've got a good friend who, who's actually taking classes at Dallas Seminary and graduate, graduate classes in expository preaching. And he told me last semester, half the students in his class were on millennium at Dallas Seminary, which was noted in total roots for years and years in dispensational theology. That was premillennial and pre-tribulation. What's the basic teaching of this? Number one, the kingdom is in existence now between Christ's two advents. Since Christ is ruling now from heaven, he will not reign on earth for a thousand years. We are in the millennium now view. Number two, the kingdom is either the church on earth or the saints in heaven. Thus there will be no future reign of Christ on earth. And 1,000 is a symbolic number indicating a long period of time. Now, what does that tell you right away here? 
They don't interpret the Bible literally, right? Literally. By the way, go to Revelation chapter 20 for a minute. Revelation chapter 20. Chapter 19, the Lord returns. Chapter 19, there's the battle of Armageddon. Chapter 20, verse 1, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil, and Satan bound him for a thousand years. And thousand years means thousand years. Bound him. Is it literally a person? Was he literally the devil? Was he literally Satan? Yes. And verse 3, cast him into the bottomless pit. Is that literally a place? Yes. And he shut him up, literally shut him up, and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations, literally nations, no more, till the thousand years were finished, second time we read it. But after these things, he, literally he, must be released, literally released, for a little while, literally a little while. And I saw thrones, literal thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment literally was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, literally beheaded. And by the way, for them to see, for him to see people who were beheaded means they had to have been what? Beheaded and resurrected. Had to be resurrected, right? For their witness, literally, to Jesus, and for the word of God, literally, who had not worshipped the beast or his image. And we know the beast is in reference to the Antichrist, a literal Antichrist, or his image, a literal image, and had not received his mark, literally, on their foreheads, literally, or on their hands, literally. And they lived, literally, and reigned, literally, with Christ, literally, for a long period of time. A thousand years. Another time, it's but the rest of the literal dead did not literally live again until the long period of time was finished. Is that how you'd interpret it? He'd literally, a thousand years. How many times have we said it now? A thousand years. I think four at this point or so. This is the first resurrection. Blessed is holy. And holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be literal priests of God, literal God and literal Christ, and shall literally reign with him for an allegorical long period of time. Oh, a thousand years. Number five. And when the thousand years have expired, six times, in seven verses, he says a thousand years, and they say, I can't mean a thousand years. Why can't I mean a thousand years? Because that doesn't fit into our theology. Again, the theology driving the bus is the problem. Number three, the promise to Israel about land, nationality, and a throne are being fulfilled now in a spiritual way among believers in the church. You know, that always amazed me. When, when he tells in Genesis 15 that the land will be from you, the Euphrates for the great river, to the great river of Egypt, how is that being fulfilled in the church today? Well, the kingdom was within you. Okay, you mean from the lungs, you know, to the intestines? Is that? No, oh, it's goofy. But that's again what happens when you let theology drive the bus. Number four, God's promises to Israel were conditional, they say, and have been transferred to the church because the nations did not meet the condition of obedience to God. You know what's really interesting about that? That amillennialist replacement theology. They love to claim the blessings of Israel, but why don't they ever claim the curses? They never seem to want to claim the curses. Number five, supposedly Christ is now in heaven where he is seated on the throne of David. And Satan is now bound between Christ's two advents. Aren't you, isn't it good to know Satan's bound? You haven't noticed any of his activity, have you, lately? Not at all. Not the Holocaust, no, no. Nowhere to be found in the Holocaust. No anti-Semitic stuff going on either, you know, just, just the sin nature, no, no satanic activity at all. And you've got to really close your eyes on that one. Huh? And then there's post-millennialism. 
And again, prefix post means after. After. And so this view holds that Christ's second coming will occur after the millennium. After the millennium. What are the basic tenets of this? Number one, the church is not the kingdom. But it will bring the kingdom to earth by preaching the gospel. Aren't you glad? That the world is actually going to get so good through the preaching of the gospel that Christ says, I am attracted and I can't wait to come back. I don't think that squares with scripture, nor does it square with experience, does it? Number two, Christ will not be on the earth during the kingdom. He will rule in the hearts of people and he will return to the earth after the millennium. Number three, the millennium will not last for a little thousand years. Number four, the church, not Israel, will receive the fulfillment of the promises to Abraham and David in a spiritual sense. By the way, you know who I heard is embracing post-millennialism? Is Kurt Cameron. Know him? The guy who was on the chief actor on the Left Behind movie. Doesn't really believe he, people will be left behind. At least now he doesn't. So post-millennialism, by the way, post-millennialism to a large degree has died off, but it's starting to regain some resurgence. You know why it's died off? Because it doesn't make any sense. Do people really think the world's getting better? And that through the preaching of the gospel we're going to bring in the kingdom? All you have to do is turn on the news. And that one goes away, let alone open your Bible. What else do we know about these three views? Well, historically, about amillennialism has its beginnings with Clement of Alexander and Origen. And remember, Origen was the origin of a lot of problems. Just easy to remember. Origen spiritualized much of Scripture and taught that the present age between the two advents of Christ is the millennium. The Emperor Constantine helped pave the way for the development of amillennialism by uniting the church and the state. This led the theologian Augustine or Augustine to teach that the church is the kingdom on earth. You know, Augustine probably impacted the church more than almost any theologian ever has. Out of Augustine came the um, Roman Catholic Church. On the one hand, on the wedding of the church and the state in a greater degree through the Bishop of Rome taking control, but also he affected the Protestant Reformation, especially in the area of perseverance, which is still a problem to this day. Postmillennialism, historically, was first taught by Daniel Whitby and held by Jonathan Edwards, Charles Wesley, Charles Hodge, etc. Postmillennialism virtually died out with two world wars that disproved the teaching that this world will get better. In recent years, it has revived. Not a lot, but it's, it's still breathing. Postmillennialism. By the way, going back to amillennialism, it's about A.D. 155, when you start to see that. Post-millennialism here. Let's see, I'm going to go on millennialism. In A.D. 155. Post-millennialism is A.D. 1638. It was Whitby. By the way, who holds to amillennialism today? What, what denominations hold to amillennialism? Almost all the liberal denominations. When it comes to postmillennialism, there are those that are called dominion theology who hold to this view. Well, there's not a lot of them, but you know who's one person who did hold to it? A dominion theology was D. James Kennedy. Ever hear of D. James Kennedy? You wonder why he was so politically involved? Not only did he have a concern for our country, but he also believed the church would bring in the kingdom. Problematic. Yeah. Premillennial. 
Premillism has a roots in the apostolic period and the early church fathers. In fact, it can be pretty much proven that the early church fathers were all premillennial. Now, who, who are the early church fathers? The people who followed the apostles. Historically, after the apostles died off, the next generation or generations, that over and over again, they believed that Christ would come up, come and set up his kingdom. They were premillennial. Some were pre-tribulational as well. What else do we know about these things? Again, personally. Amillennialism is involves covenant theology, reform theology, Presbyterianism, and other groups as well. Postmillennialism, again, Dominion theology, premillennialism, early church. The early church was premillennial. And you know, there are some people who actually concede the point. You would think they would repent then, right? Because if the apostolic apostles and then the early church embraced this, why would you not embrace it? But again, so often their theology drives their interpretation of Scripture. What is the hermeneutical basis for these views? Amillennialism. The kingdom in the church. They also promote the unity of the people of God. By the way, progressive dispensationalists, progressive. And whenever you hear progressive whatever, it usually means regressive. They think they're progressive because they are shaking hands with the amillennialists, but they're not quite there yet. Also teach about the unity of the people of God instead of the distinction between Israel and the church. Israel and the church then they misinterpret Jews and Gentiles as one. There's the spiritualizing of prophecy as they spiritualize prophecies to Israel and apply them to the church. And frankly, you know, if someone were to ask me, why am I a dispensationalist? Would I say, well, it's because I, I carry a Schofield Bible. That's why I'm a dispensationalist. No, that's not. What is the bottom line? Why? Would one be a dispensationalist? Robert? Um, you want to grab a mic? Because as you read through scripture, you see that God uh, treats, us, treats people at different ways and at different times. So dispensationalism is a system we come up with to um, try to harmonize those passages and make sense of it all. It, it appears that God is treating people dispensationally. Okay, let's go uh, even a layer below that. Why are you a dispensationalist? Because you interpret the Bible in a normal, grammatical, historical, contextual way. That's why. And when you do that, then that's what you do. You start to see that God has dealt with different people in different ways over different periods of time with different economies. You see, there's a difference between Israel and the church. There's a difference between law and grace. There was a difference of life before the fall and after, before the flood and after, before the Babel and after, before the law and after, before the cross and after. You see those distinctions. But it's not just merely interpreting the Bible in a normal, grammatical, historical, contextual way, but to do it consistently, even in prophetic passages. Because you see, many amillennials would interpret the virgin birth of Christ, literally. They'd interpret the deity of Christ, literally. They'd interpret the death of Christ, literally. They'd interpret the resurrection, resurrection of Christ, literally. So what's the problem? When they come to prophetic passages, they don't interpret them literally. So they don't consistently apply that hermeneutic. They have what they call a dual hermeneutic, or the progressives have what they call a complementary hermeneutic instead of consistently applying that hermeneutic. When it comes to postmillennialism, again, normal grammatic, oops, postmillennialism. Let's see what I have here. Do I have anything on them? It's in Zook's book. That's all I'll say because I don't have any more. <laughs> Premillennialism, again, normal grammatical interpretation of scriptural Israel 
in the land with the king one day, Israel and the church are distinct. There's a consistency in interpretation. By the way, how do you know how to interpret prophecy? You know how you know how to interpret it? I'll tell you, we have no excuse. Because we can look back at the Old Testament